In the beginning, God, the love of our souls, the source of goodness, truth, and justice, a perfect kingdom of love and light. Until war broke out in heaven through one fallen angel who broke God's perfect law, Lucifer coveted God's throne and authority and deceived one third of the angels to rebel against the Holy One. Since that time, Earth is a war zone where the forces of light and darkness, good and evil, truth and deceit battle it out in a life or death conflict. Are you just a spectator or have you taken sides? Are you living the victorious life God intended for you to have? Let Marla Alona guide you through the truth of God's Word, that you may choose right, that you may have life and have it more abundantly, and that God's truth may bring you eternal life. Welcome to Setting the Record Straight, God's Truth for This Generation. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. In today's program, we'll be talking some more about the great conflict that started in heaven and will continue until God has eradicated evil from the universe. We'll also be discussing how to win the war so that Jesus can come back and take us all home. We haven't yet finished the series on the Hebrew feast called Messiah's Calendar, and I'll be working on part three of that series right after this program. But I had to interrupt this series because I wanted to share with you an experience I had a couple of weeks ago as I was preparing to travel to Arkansas. I was invited to speak at a church there to do a kickoff for a drive through prayer. The prayer team had done a fantastic job. They were very organized. They had thought through all the details. And overall, it was a high Sabbath. The Lord stirred up the community to drive by for prayer, we had lots of volunteers. Um, it was wonderful. And although things seemed peaceful enough on the surface, behind the scenes, there was some serious warfare going on. Let's get started. A spiritual attack. Two nights before traveling to Arkansas, I suffered a significant warfare attack. I get these quite often, actually. Never talk about it, especially not publicly. But I've decided to share this one with you because it really illustrates the topic of today's study. City Bible Group is a ministry that was birthed in warfare, and it continues to this day. When I was involved in the New Age and occultism, I opened many doors to the enemy. I was like Swiss cheese, to be humorous, except that it isn't funny. This is why the Lord said in Isaiah 58, 12, that we need to be the repairers of the breach. The breach is sin. Sin has made a hole in God's law. God's law is God's hedge of protection around us. When we sin, we make holes in the wall, and the enemy has the legal right to attack us. It's a long story how I came to the Lord after living most of my life in darkness. And there's a reason why the Lord still allows some of these attacks to happen. But in the midst of the attack, He and His angels are always with me, defending and protecting me. This particular evening, as I said, uh, a couple of nights before flying to Arkansas, I was starting to get ready for bed. I happened to check my email on my phone and I saw an invitation from a professional network site to connect to someone from my past, a French woman who had been one of my Feng Shui students. I've discontinued all communication with all of my dear friends in France because all of them were involved in the New Age. That was my entire social circle. And I will, I know the Lord will give me the opportunity someday to go back to France to witness to them. But for now, I've uh, suspended all communication. And this woman's request to connect had already come up uh, through the network about a month prior. I had ignored it. I didn't really, you know, I was, as I said. So here it is, shows up again. I reflect it for a moment, and two thoughts went from my, through my mind. First, I felt real compassion for her. It really grieved me to reject her a second time. And second, I reasoned to myself that I had nothing to fear from her because after all, I had been the more evil of the two, right? She was the student, I was a teacher. So I didn't think that to connect with her could harm me in any way. I also had no intention of engaging with her 
in any way. I simply didn't want to reject her request to connect for, for the second time. She's a professional. This site is a professional network, not like a chat room or not like Facebook, where people are directly engaging with each other. So again, I clicked accept, put down my phone, thought nothing more of it. Barely a couple of minutes later, I felt this evil entity glue itself to the back of my head on the right side. It was painful. I started, I immediately knew it was an attack. I've been through this before, right? So I started rebuking the enemy and crying out to the Lord. But the thing wouldn't leave. And after a while, I, I was, obviously I had to pack, I was busy. I just resigned myself to the fact that I, it was gonna be there for, I don't know, a, a few hours, a few days, and I was just gonna have to pray this off, as I have done with other things in the past. So I, you know, pack, get ready for the trip. When I'm finally ready to go to bed, I start combing my hair, and all of a sudden, I feel this throbbing pain on the right side, on the back of my head, in the same spot, but a horrendous throbbing pain, as if someone had literally struck me on the head with a club or something. And then, a short while later, I feel the same kind of pain, maybe not so intense, on the left side, on the back, still the back of my head. And after a short while, this bump starts to emerge. Now, now I know this is going to stretch your belief system, but the reality is there was no one, no one in the room with me. This is all a spiritual attack, but as if someone had clubbed me really hard on the head and I, this bump starts to develop on the right side and on the left, there was like a little lesion, like a cut. And I, of course, this was all happening in preparation to my speaking at this church in Arkansas. I prayed fervently and then went to bed completely exhausted. I couldn't have been asleep very long. Uh, I don't know, maybe a half hour possibly, if that. A dream vision woke me up. It was a vision on the screen of my mind, not outside before my eyes, but literally on the screen of my mind, like inside my head. But it was very real. It was a very real vision. It was a vision of Leviathan, like his side. I could see the side of the dragon. Leviathan is the serpent, the sea monster, the enemy of God and of God's people. I saw the side of his body. I saw the scales. And uh, if you don't know who Leviathan is, if you don't know who I'm talking about, you must listen to podcast 034, The Battle is Real. Unfortunately, I've had encounters with Leviathan before, so I recognized him immediately. And I'm still lying in bed, my eyes closed, but I have a strong sense of the Holy Spirit urging me to get up and pray. It was, at this point, it was around 2.30 in the morning, I had gone to bed very late, around 1.30, so it, it was around 2.30. I was extremely tired. I tried to ignore the feeling, but it just got stronger. Get up and pray, the, like the Holy Spirit just compelling me to get up and pray. I couldn't sleep anymore. I felt tired to get out of bed, but I remembered something I had read that Sister Ellen White wrote about the Apostle Peter. She had said, she wrote, that if Peter had prayed, he wouldn't have denied Jesus. I, re I forget which uh, book this is in. But that statement that if Peter had prayed, he wouldn't have denied Jesus, so impressed me. It was so engraved in my mind that I got out of bed and I got on my knees and I started to pray. And then indeed I could, I could sense all kinds of things happening in the spirit world. I was, I was shaking, I was frightened, I knew I was under attack, I knew this was um, the darkest uh, evil power, and I was very frightened, but I just kept just praying and reading the word. I just, was just reading the word out loud. Finally, about an hour later, it must have been, the attack passed. The dragon left, the Lord had protected me, and my prayer had not been in vain. My reading the word had not been in vain. And, the, but, but still I was so shaken, I didn't fall asleep until after four in the morning, very late, maybe 4.30 in the morning, because I literally was so shaken. Now why am I sharing this story with you? I want you to understand 
couple of things. The battle is very real, and the spirit world is very real. Satan plays dirty. That The spirit entity that attacked me on the head was triggered by that simple action in social media. It gave my simple action in social media, accepting that woman's request to connect, gave the appearance of backsliding. It gave the appearance of me going back to my past. This is why the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from all appearance of evil. The Lord is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And he knew very well that I wasn't backsliding. I just felt compassion on this woman. But the demons didn't know that. I was innocently foolish by accepting to connect with her. And, and I, trust me, I've been innocently foolish many times before in this warfare, and I have paid a very high price for it. Our Christian walk is riddled with landmines. One false step and the enemy will blow you up. If you are serious about your walk with Christ, you will suffer persecution. No mystery about that, especially if you have a past and the enemy doesn't want to let go of, of you and, and uh, is constantly uh, trying to make claims. You have to be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, is out there roaring like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. I want to demonstrate to you that this is completely biblical. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, Jesus and the disciples were having Passover dinner. The dinner takes place right before the events of Jesus' passion in the Garden of Gethsemane. Listen to the conversation between Jesus and Peter. And this, this was a critical conversation. This conversation between Jesus and Peter happens right after Jesus has announced to the disciples that one of them will betray him. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. This is in Luke 22, 31 through 34. Later that evening, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus went to pray and asked his disciples to also watch and pray. A supernatural slumber came upon them, a heavy drowsiness that they couldn't resist. Their eyes kept closing. I'm sure they had the best intention in the world, but they could not stay awake. It was a supernatural drowsiness. Jesus came back the first time and found them asleep. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. This is in Matthew 26, 40 through 41. Jesus obviously has perfect foresight. He knows that Peter is going to be tempted. Uh, he knew what was going to happen, and he was trying to get Peter to pray so that he could avoid it. Now, what happened to Peter after he had failed to pray? as Jesus has a had asked him to do. First of all, when the priest and, and the um, elders and their entourage came to take Jesus prisoner, Peter took out his sword and cut off the ear of one of them. You remember the story, Jesus rebuked him and put the ear back on. This is uh, described in John 18, 10. Later that night, when Jesus had been brought to the high priest, Peter followed after him. You all know the story uh, when certain Jews recognized Peter as being a follower of Jesus. Peter denied him indeed three times and then the cock crowed just as Jesus had prophesied. Peter left and wept bitterly. And this is described both in John 18 and in Luke 22, two witnesses. Now the outcome, obviously the outcome would have been much worse if Jesus had not prayed for Peter, as Jesus spoke at the dinner, he said, I have prayed for you. I've prayed for you, Peter. 
You're listening to Setting the Record Straight, God's Truth for This Generation. So that intercession was being heard in heaven. Therefore, even though Satan managed to shake Peter and he sinned, yet he received the gift of repentance on the spot and learned a very powerful lesson that would serve him throughout his ministry. When Peter said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, he wrote that that in 1 Peter 5, 8. Peter knew exactly what he was talking about. He had lived it in the flesh. He had experienced it firsthand. Now, Satan may not attack you as he attacks me, but he'll tempt you. The temptation may come through a person, a social network, a behavior, a food, a TV program, music, a movie, or a myriad of other avenues. This is why Sister White said, guard the five senses for they are the avenues to the soul. Unless you pray without ceasing, you'll fall into temptation. It is a fact. This is why the Bible says, pray without ceasing. Also, learn from my story, keep away from the appearance of evil because both people and demons can't read your mind. God can, but they can't. Who's involved in this war? From everlasting to everlasting is God, the creator of all things. In Exodus 34, when Moses had asked the Lord if he would show him his glory, this is how God presented himself to Moses. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Exodus 34, 6 through 7. The war between good and evil started in heaven thousands of years ago. Lucifer was a covering cherub who was perfect in his ways from the day that he was created until iniquity was found in him. Ezekiel 28, verse 1. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. This created being began to trade lies in heaven, misrepresenting the character of God before the angels. In fact, even as God is our judge, God also stands accused by Satan the accuser. So Satan is not only the accuser of the brethren, he's also God's accuser. Therefore, the angels are all involved in this war, both God's holy angels who remained obedient to him, as well as Satan's fallen angels who followed Satan in his rebellion. A third of the host of heaven followed Satan, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Revelation 12, 7 through 9. Revelation 12, 4 says that the dragon with his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. In the Bible, The stars of heaven represent angels. This means that a third of the angels followed Satan. Humans are also participants in this warfare. When Satan tempted Eve in the garden, he planted in her mind the same kinds of doubts that he planted in the minds of the angels. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Genesis 3.1 He was trying to make God's law grievous by adding requirements that went beyond anything God had ever asked for. God had said, you shall not eat of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, one tree. Now Satan is saying, you shall not eat 
Yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So adding requirements, this is exactly what Satan did with the Sabbath. He burdened it with so many requirements that the Jewish people had no pleasure anymore in keeping the Sabbath. Then the serpent contradicted God's word. God had said that they would die, and the serpent said, you shall not surely die, Genesis 3, 4. And then to top it off, the serpent insinuated that God had a power agenda. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil, Genesis 3, 5. Satan was promising Eve that she could be as God, having forbidden knowledge, and being able to define within herself what is good and what is evil. The only reason God didn't zap Satan and nip the rebellion in the bud is because if he had, the angelic beings would still harbor doubt in their minds as to whether Satan's accusations were true or not. God is allowing Satan's plan and his evil government to play out until the limit is reached. There's always a limit to God's mercy. When the limit is reached, then God will put an end to it. But this is so that the entire universe may witness the absolute disaster that Satan's rule brings. <laughs> The Evil Hierarchy. Ephesians 6 is the well-known chapter where Paul describes the full armor of God. He also gives us the evil hierarchy of the kingdom of darkness. Let's read Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. So Paul reassures us that if we put on the full armor of God, we will not fall, but we will stand. Paul is using two techniques here to reassure us that we have the guarantee of the victory. Let's notice, first of all, the sandwich technique. First, Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, and put on the full armor of God, and you'll be empowered to stand. Second, he gives us the bad news. In the middle, he gives us the bad news. He describes the enemy and names the different layers of the hierarchy, the different levels of the kingdom of darkness. And then thirdly, he again exhorts us to put on the armor that we may stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. So in the sandwich technique, the enemy is trapped in the middle. As long as we're wearing the armor, we have the victory. Hallelujah. The other technique that he's using is based on the scripture that says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. This is an incredibly important um, legal concept in the Hebrew law. And the Lord uses it in scripture. He, he applies it himself in the word. After you've listened to the podcast, I would like for you to go to the website and read the blog post that I posted on this recently. I believe it's called the power of agreement. In these verses, Paul says twice. In other words, he gives us two witnesses that by putting on the armor, we won't fall as Adam and Eve fell, but instead we'll be able to stand. In any war, the best way to obtain the victory is to know your enemy. Again, Paul tells us that we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Let's take them one by one. Principalities. At the very top of the evil hierarchy are the principalities. Principalities have authority over kingdoms and territories. The word principality comes from the word prince. 
Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Satan is the Prince of Darkness. Think of Daniel 10, when the Archangel Gabriel tells Daniel that he'd been sent to answer Daniel's prayer, but was retained by the Prince of Persia. Think of the word kingdom, as in kingdom of light and kingdom of darkness. Jesus referred to Satan as the prince of this world because he usurped Adam's domain, planet Earth. Satan took control of the territory and everything in it, including human beings. Satan is also called the prince of the power of the air because he controls the airways and the Earth's atmosphere. In Ephesians 2, Verses 1 and 2, Paul is speaking to us and he says, And you, he, referring to Jesus, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Powers. The second level in the hierarchy is powers. Evil powers cause or command to cause strife, violence, war, death, poverty, famine, disease, cruelty, prejudice, oppression, sexual immorality, and even natural disasters. Rulers of the darkness of this world. The rulers of the darkness of this world prevent people from receiving God's truth. They keep people blinded and deaf. You can preach the gospel until you're blue in the face. Certain people are so spellbound that they just can't hear it. You can put all the evidence in the world in front of their eyes. They can't see it. 2 Corinthians 4 tells us, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. 2 Corinthians 4. Spiritual blindness is a very important topic. The Bible has numerous verses that talk about this. Let's consider now Matthew 13, verse 15. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. The other witnesses to this verse are in Isaiah 6.10, Jeremiah 5.21, and Ezekiel 12.2. Remember how scales fell from Paul's eyes after Ananias touched him in the book of Acts chapter 9? Who has scales? The serpent, of course, the dragon, Leviathan. That being has scales. The supernatural slumber that came upon the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, that heavy drowsiness that they couldn't resist, that was put upon them by the rulers of the darkness of this world. They are responsible for spiritual blindness. Laodicea, the last church of the seven churches in the book of Revelation, is also stricken with spiritual blindness. Jesus counseled us to anoint our eyes with eyesob that we may see. Spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. The spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places execute the orders coming down from the top. They create strife and unleash chaos. They tempt harass, and torment believers. These hosts of wickedness have no other agenda than to steal, kill, and destroy. Satan and his fallen angels have caused the damnation of hundreds of millions, if not billions of souls who were seeking spiritual truth but were deceived. These evil spirits bring apostasy, paganism, witchcraft, and other abominations such as pedophilia, into the highest levels of the church. They introduced false worship on the day of the sun. They devise all counterfeit spirituality, whether in the Vatican, in the New Age, or any other form of organized religion that is not Bible-based. You're listening to Setting the Record Straight, God's Truth for This Generation.
These are the ones who would deceive, if it were possible, even the very elect. Matthew 24, 24. Satan and his demons are responsible for casting down the sanctuary and Jesus' daily intercession in the holy place. Let's read a few scriptures. Let's start with Daniel. Yea, he, referring to the Antichrist, magnified himself even to the prince of the host, who is Jesus, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of the sanctuary was cast down, and an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Daniel 8, 11 and 12. This is referring to the fact that the Pope Um, positions himself as the substitute for Christ. The priests position themselves, together with the saints and the Virgin Mary, position themselves as mediators between man and God, when in reality the only mediator is Jesus Christ. This was a form of casting down Jesus' intercession in the holy place. Let's read another one. And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall, speaking again uh, of the Antichrist, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Daniel eleven thirty one. 31. Remember, the abomination of desolation, that's the sign of of the end, right? That's what we're waiting for. The abomination of desolation, the abomination that makes desolate, referred to in Daniel 11, this is exactly what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 24 when he said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, then you know it is time to flee. Let's continue. Psalm 74, verse 7, they have defiled by casting down the dwelling place of thy name to the ground. And then Psalm 74, same Psalm, verse 3, Lift up thy feet into the perpetual desolations, even all that the enemy hath done wickedly in the sanctuary. Satan and his fallen angels are preparing the way for the Antichrist, also called the son of perdition. This is the spirit of Judas, the other son of perdition, who betrayed Jesus with a kiss. The Antichrist will betray Jesus with a kiss posturing as the friend of God, when in reality, he's the arch enemy of God. What is the war over? The war is over subjects or souls, the territories or realms they possess or inhabit, and over thrones or modes of government. First and foremost, the war is about regaining souls. In Leviticus 25, we read about the Hebrew laws of redemption, which dictate how lost property may be reclaimed and how someone who sold himself into slavery may be redeemed. Only a next of kin can redeem them. By their disobedience, Adam and Eve sold themselves and their descendants into slavery. Jesus had to play by the rules, by the Hebrew rules of redemption, in order to redeem us. He had to be incarnated as flesh and blood so that he could be part of the human family, he could be our next of kin, in order to be able to pay the price for us. No human was qualified to redeem humanity because no human being had the spotless record of being without sin. There is none righteous, no, not one, Romans 3.10. It also had to be a member of the Godhead because ultimately only the Godhead could forgive this debt of sin because the wages of sin is death. Only the Godhead had the authority, the spiritual authority to pardon that spiritual debt. Jesus was willing to give up heaven for a season He agreed to risk being tempted as we are. And, you know, this was a real walk for Jesus. He had no safety net. If he had sinned, if he had fallen into temptation, he would have lost it all. He would have lost his divinity. He would have lost his life. Because he was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin, according to Hebrews 4.15. 
the war is also about regaining the lost possession or the lost dominion of planet Earth. Adam and Eve had handed over their dominion to Satan through their disobedience. Their sin gave Satan the legal right to take dominion over them and as a consequence to take dominion over their possession. The basis of the concept of legal right is explained in Romans 6.16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Adam and Eve obeyed the serpent and disobeyed God. Therefore, they found themselves, and we as their descendants, we find ourselves slaves to Satan, unless we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. In Luke 4, verses 5 and 6, we read, Then the devil, taking him, referring to Jesus, this is about the temptation of Jesus in the desert, then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, him referring to Jesus, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory. For this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. This is why Jesus referred to Satan as the prince of this world. Legally, Adam and Eve had handed over the dominion to Satan. Now, there's an important, very important distinction we need to understand about the process of redemption. Redemption is a process. It's not a one a one-time deal, and we'll talk a lot more about that in our next program, Messiah's Calendar, where we will map the ministry of Jesus to the Hebrew feasts. At the cross, Jesus bought us back and the land. He redeemed us for a price. The price was his blood, was his death. He bought us back. The price was paid in full, but we haven't yet been brought back nor has he yet possessed the land, right? We have, still have the enemy camping out here on planet Earth, and we are still here. We have not been brought back. We've been paid for, but we've not been taken home yet. This will take place after Jesus comes back. If the process of redemption were indeed finished, we wouldn't be here. We'd all be where Jesus is. And that's where we'll be when it is finished. The cross was a very important milestone and when Jesus said, it is finished, he meant, yes, phase one. Phase one of the plan is, of redemption is finished. Yes, I've paid the price. And he also meant, yes, it is finished. What is finished? The Levitical priesthood is finished. The era of animal sacrifice is finished. He has paid the price. But we're still waiting for Jesus to come back as the King of kings and Lord of lords, the conquering king that will reclaim the subjects and the land and will impose his government. And precisely the mode of government is another reason why we're in a cosmic war. Whose government shall rule the universe? God's or Satan's? Whose throne shall prevail? God's government is built upon his holy law, the Ten Commandments. This is why they rest in the Ark of the Covenant underneath the mercy seat. The law is the foundation of God's throne. We read earlier that Satan wants to sit above God's throne. He wants to rule over the universe. He wants to impose rebellion and disobedience to God's law. God needed to let Satan's mode of government play itself out. It had to unfold so that the citizens of the universe could see where rebellion and disobedience would lead. It would lead to chaos, death, and total destruction, ultimately total destruction. By their fruits, you shall know them. So the citizens of heaven had to see the fruits of Satan's government so that they could see who Satan really is. Fortunately, Satan will not prevail. We know how the story ends. In Daniel 7, 13 and 14, we read what happened when Jesus ascended to heaven after his death and resurrection. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, 
and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. God's character vindicated before the universe. God's character will be vindicated before the universe in several ways. We said earlier that his mode of government will have been proven to be better than Satan's mode of government. That's one way in which his character will be vindicated. Let's consider some other ways. His judgments will be proven to be just and fair. We said earlier that the accuser accuses God of being unjust, not just us, he accuses God of being unjust. In Psalm 51 verse 4, King David said, Against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. We have a second witness to the fact that in the judgment process, we're not the only ones being judged, but God also is being judged. Second witness is Paul in Romans 3, 4. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you, referring to the Lord, may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. So God is judged. God is also seated in the seat of the accused. Now, King David, when he, in, in the Psalm, King David says, when you judge, but Paul very clearly says, when you are judged, the watching universe will scrutinize every case, every decision to see whether God has been just. Therefore, in order to totally vindicate God's character, his judgments need to be pronounced just and fair by all, right? In the book of Revelation, chapter 15, the 144,000 proclaim that God's judgments are true and righteous. In Revelation 16, the angels proclaim that God's judgments are true and righteous. And all, including the wicked, including the fallen angels, shall acknowledge that God's judgment upon them was fair. This is in Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 10 to 11 is actually a prophetic scripture that will be fulfilled at the end of the millennium. Another way in which God's character will be vindicated is by the demonstration that his law can be kept. Yes, it can be kept. Satan says that no one can keep God's law, that only Jesus was able to overcome sin because he was God. This is why so many Christian churches teach that we'll be sinning until Jesus comes. But the 144,000 will be the evidence before the universe that demonstrates conclusively that God's law can be kept. The 144,000 are a people that God is refining and preparing for the time of trouble and for the great obedience test coming at the end of time. The test is between the mark of the beast and the seal of God. No one will be allowed to buy or sell without the mark of the beast. Those who resist and refuse the mark of the beast will suffer thirst and hunger. Worst of all, they'll suffer great persecution, ridicule, and marginalization. But the 144,000 will stand strong and will not fall in the face of atrocious temptation and cruel persecution. This is a faithful remnant. They keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 14, 12 says they have the testimony of Jesus and Revelation 19, 10 translates that and tells us that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The 144,000 are commandment keepers and therefore they're Sabbath keepers who will remain faithful to God, though the heavens fall. They will keep God's law out of love and not out of coercion. 
Quite the contrary, the enemy will deploy all of his evil strategies and, and ammunition and weapons to coerce them to violate God's law, but he will not prevail against them. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death, Revelation 12, 11. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Revelation 14.1 You're listening to Setting the Record Straight, God's Truth for This Generation. The hundred and forty-four thousand have no guile in their mouths, meaning they do not speak or teach false doctrine or false teachings. They're virgins, meaning they're not literally virgins, but they have no part in apostate churches or harlot churches. They're the first fruits of God. This characteristic always puzzled me. It actually troubled me because I wanted to understand what does it mean? What does that mean to be the first fruits? Because they're actually the last fruits because the Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first and then After that, those who are alive and remain will be translated into glorious bodies, and then they will rise. So they will rise last. So they're they're the last fruits. So I couldn't understand, and I was praying and asking the Lord to show me and and teach me what does it mean that they're the first fruits. And the Holy Spirit answered my prayer, and it became very clear to me when I read this verse in James 1.18 that says, He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. This is in this is actually uh, the NIV translation which I find better than the King James or the New King James for this particular passage. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So the 144,000 were not always without sin, but by a process of sanctification through the word of God, they will be eventually without sin. First fruits of the word. What's another way of saying this? The 144,000 literally live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Once God's character has been vindicated by all in the eyes of all, God shall proceed to destroy sin and sinners as well as Satan and his fallen angels. All of them will be cast into the lake of fire, thereby ending the problem of sin in the universe. From this death, this is the second death, there is no resurrection. How do we win the war? Technically, this war is not against us. It's between Christ and Satan. It was Michael the Archangel. Michael is one of the names of Christ. Michael means who is like God, who cast the dragon out of heaven. Unfortunately, we humans are caught in the middle. Remember the prophecy spoken by God to the serpent in Genesis 3.15? And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Well, there's a very revealing verse in Revelation 12, 17 that's in direct continuity with Genesis 3:15. It tells us how much the dragon hates God's remnant people. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 12, 17. We had already read uh, part of the scripture earlier. The woman is the faithful commandment-keeping church. In the same chapter, in Revelation 12, the great red dragon spewed water out of his mouth against the woman. We know that in Bible prophecy, A woman stands for a church, and water means multitudes of people, tongues, and nations. Revelation 12 is therefore telling us that multitudes would come against God's faithful church. This prophecy 
in Revelation 12 was already fulfilled during the 1260 years of papal supremacy, which became known as the Dark Ages in Europe. During the Dark Ages, the papacy persecuted God's saints. So that's how the prophecy was fulfilled. And the papacy turned multitudes against God's people and horrendous persecution was unleashed. And the, although this prophecy was already fulfilled, something very similar will happen again at the end of time. Well, the question then is, how do we overcome with such a formidable opponent coming against us with great wrath? Our greatest weapon is holiness. Be ye holy because I am holy. Leviticus 11, 44 and 45 Leviticus 19, verse 2, and Leviticus 20, verse 26. Three witnesses. Be ye holy, because I am holy. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 27. And no, this is not only Old Testament. We have a New Testament witness to this. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. What Peter is doing is confirming that that Old Testament instruction remains in effect for us today. We have to stop sinning. We have got to stop sinning. It's as simple as that. We can't give the enemy any more legal right. There can be no more sin in the camp of Israel. This requires moving into the most holy place where Jesus is. Most Christians are still in the outer court, and some are even in the camp. Most Christians are fixated on the cross. Jesus' sacrifice, which was offered in the court, but since dying in the court, Jesus has already moved through the holy place to perform intercession on our behalf, applying the blood of the new covenant to our sins, and he moved through that, and he's now in the, holy, in the most holy place, still interceding for us, but also performing judgment on God's people. The most holy place is where the law is. The law is inside the Ark of the Covenant. The most holy place is the only place where we can obtain the seal of God because the seal is the Sabbath. The most holy place is where the law is, inside the Ark of the Covenant. And if you're thinking, like most Christians, that the law is of no effect and we're under grace, not under the law, listen to what the Bible says in Revelation 11, verse 19. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the Ark of His Covenant was seen in His temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. This passage is describing what happens at the seventh trumpet, which triggers the great day of the Lord when Jesus returns. God is trying to bring us back into obedience to the law so that we can be sealed with the law. Without the law, there's no seal. Outside the most holy place, there's no seal. You have to be with Jesus in the most holy place to receive God's name on your forehead, and that will protect you through the time of trouble until Jesus comes. You have to give your sins to Jesus by confessing them. Only then can he apply his blood to them to wash them away. Only then can he blot out the record of your sins from the sanctuary. We have to be like Jesus, who is able to say, the prince of this world cometh, and he hath nothing in me. John 14, verse 30. A chosen generation. Satan wants to destroy us. God wants to save us. It's very simple. It is black and white. But we have to stop sinning if we want God to save us. God is calling us to a very high calling. But you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The King James Version says, 
a peculiar people. You can't be conformed to this world anymore. Don't be afraid to be peculiar. Learn to be peculiar. Abstain from the lusts of this world. In perfect symmetry, the world started with an obedience test and will end with an obedience test. We are called to stand where Adam and Eve fell. There are mighty promises that we can stand on. Romans 14.4 says, He shall be held up, for God is able to make a man to stand. Hallelujah! God is able to make a man to stand. Listen to Jude one twenty four. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Lord, who alone is wise, be honor and majesty, dominion and power, now and forevermore. These scriptures are so encouraging. We can't do it alone. We are not able to stop sinning alone. But God can do it in us. If we surrender everything to him, he will finish the work in us. Finishing the work is having the victory over sin and winning the war. We don't have to fall. God has promised to give us the victory over sin. We are called to follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And that means to the victory. Jesus overcame where Adam fell. And He's calling us to do the same. You know, many of us have such sinful pasts. Me, the first, that we can't get there without much suffering. I know that's my case, but I take great comfort in this scripture about Jesus in Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So Jesus learned obedience by the things which he suffered, and he became perfect. If we're willing, Jesus will teach us that same obedience until we become perfect. Be perfect because thy Father in heaven is perfect. It will require going through the furnace of affliction to remove the dross from the gold. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Daniel 12.10 God wants us to be wise unto salvation. Our faith will be severely tested, but we can do it. Jesus did it, and He's our example. When He has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Job 23 verse 10 And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Thank you for listening to Setting the Record Straight, God's truth for this generation. If you've been blessed by this program, we encourage you to share it with others. To ask any question related to this Bible study or any other spiritual matter, email us at info at citybiblegroup.com. To find out more, visit our website at citybiblegroup.com. Hi, I'm Marla Ilana. Thank you so much for studying God's Word with me. Please click on the subscribe button below and you'll be blessed with many more powerful truths for our generation. Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready?